Hello everyone, my name is Yu Hang Li and I teach Chinese art history at the University of Wisconsin Madison. My book, Becoming Guanyin Artistic Devotion of Buddhist Women in Late Imperial China, was published by the Columbia University Press earlier this year. It is the first book in the series called Pre Modern East Asia New Horizons. Becoming Guanyin mainly concerns women's material practices in relation to the female deity Guanyin in late imperial China. Guanyin in Chinese means the perceiver of songs. Guanyin originated in India and is called Avaloki Tathvara, or the Bodhisattva of Compassion. As the illustration on your right explains, the Bodhisattva of Compassion can manifest in different forms. However, this deity is usually represented as a male deity in India. The image on your left provides a typical example of a bronze statue made in Gandhara during the 3rd century. Following Buddhism's spread in China, he gradually became indigenized as a female deity over the span of nearly a thousand years. By the Ming and the Qing dynasty, Guanyin's female forms were much more prevalent than its male forms. Hence, Guanyin was generally worshipped uh, as a female deity. The glazed white robed Guanyin statue made in the Ming period shows uh, the utmost femininity on her face. Most scholarship on Guanyin has primarily focused on the textual transformations or iconographic variations in the images of Guanyin over time. But I shift to the relationship that obtained between worshipped and worshipper in practice. I ask a simple question. What did Buddhist lay women in late imperial China actually do to forge a connection with the subject of their devotion, the Bodhisattva Guanyin? In particular, my book turns to the actual objects created and used by women to study women's lives directly. I argue that women used their own bodies to echo that of Guanyin. The power of material things enabled women to access religious experience and transcendence. Becoming Guanyin shows how secular Buddhist women expressed mimetic devotion and pursued religious salvation through creative depictions of Guanyin in different media, such as painting and embroidery, and through bodily portrayals of the deity using jewelry and dance. Here is the outline of my book, and each chapter deals with a different set of questions related to a particular medium and the women from different social strata. This materials expressed a worldview that was different from, yet fit within the Confucian patriarchal uh, system. I use uh, Becoming Guanyin as a way to describe uh, different modes of women's mimetic devotion. This term thinks critically about just how women created that bodily connection. Their devotions must be understood in light of the distinction between becoming and being. Becoming Guanyin was always a process uh, that never accumulated in being Guanyin. Still, women's determination to approach Guanyin gave purpose and direction to their lives. The four different modes, painting, embroidering, mimicking through jewelry, and dancing uh, created Guanyin's presence by using their bodies in different uh, ways. This book uh, moves from textual to material sources. I begin with a discussion of dance, uh, which focuses on Buddhist courtesans' practice. In particular, I focus on a case study of Xu Jinghong, a famous courtesan dancer of Guanyin dance, who combines her religious practice and her profession. I won't be able to explain the details of the complicated relationship between courtesans and Guanyin today. If you're interested, please read my book. But I do want to point out that in a book largely on making and using objects, this chapter offers a contrasting example of devotion. Dance, although ephemeral, is essentially a material practice. However, many of the material elements could not be or were not preserved. The accounts of Kurtizan's religious practice were recorded by male scholars pursuing various agendas. 
So Guan Yin dance was constructed within a male discourse. This chapter demonstrates the limits of the textual approach, which become clear in light of the following chapters on painting, embroidery, and jewelry. The second chapter discusses a gentry woman's practice of Guan Yin painting. Gentry woman usually refers to scholar officials' mothers, wives, and daughters. They had education. Most of these women were also listed as exemplary women by local gazetteers. You're looking at uh, the various Guan Yin paintings created uh, by women uh, painters. Guan Yin was, of course, a popular subject for uh, painters of both uh, genders. But uh, the rhetorical trope of women painters of Guan Yin suggests that during the late Ming and early Qing, Bai Miao, our plain drawings, was not just an aesthetic choice, but contained moral judgment and a symbolic meaning associated with the identity of gentry women. The feminine form of Guan Yin in plain drawing, with its absence of added color, was seen to mirror female purity and to express women's roles as wives, mothers, daughters, and widows. For instance, uh, Xing Cijing had a delayed motherhood, only bearing a child nearly age 40. She created this painting after she gave birth to a son as a way to express her gratitude to Guan Yin. She uses extremely delicate ink lines and creates Guan Yin in soft contours. In the process of making such hair-thin strokes, Xing could not use the conventional method of tracing a model to make a draft or uh, make even the slightest mistake. Such an intense practice fosters an intimate relationship between the artist and the icon, also mirror uh, her motherly compassion with Guan Yin's compassion. The third chapter discusses how embroidery as a devotional medium was uh, dissimilar from other devotional practices and the complicated reasons for which people engaged in this kind of a materialization. Particularly, I focus on hair embroidery, the highest form of devotional embroidery, and ask how and in what uh, circumstances woman's hair was applied uh, to embroidery. How physical pain of plucking out the hair and the process of making hair, such as splitting one hair into multiple strands and stitching hairs as a thread, are all part of devotion. As you can see on screen, there are different ways of using hair as a thread. The technique of using hair is part of devotion. The female pr practitioners create a tangible image of Guan Yin using a part of their own bodies. The chapter 4 centers on a unique um, burial tradition that existed in China during the Ming period. When women devotees were buried, their hair uh, was adorned with wigs and hairpins depicting Amitabha Buddha in a way that uh, resembled Bodhisattva Guan Yin's hairpin. I investigate this uh, corporeal practice on two levels. First, I discuss how female devotees used women's things to respond to the feminized Guan Yin, especially as fashion and religious practice became intertwined. These hair ornaments became more complex and it began uh, to embody overlapping meanings. Second, I argue that when women wore hairpins similar to Guan Yin's, these hairpins did not simply function as talismans. Rather, we see the emergence of a new idea that physical likeness to the deity enabled a transcendence of the finite world. On your left, the image of Guan Yin as a guide of soul made in the 10th century shows a female soul follows Guan Yin on her way to the Pure Land. But the case of women wearing a hairpin similar to Guan Yin's in the 17th century, like the images in the middle and right, we see new mimetic means of forging the relationship between Guan Yin and her worshippers, 
created the conditions for the worshippers merging with the worshipped. The purpose of such mimesis is to enable women's rapid transformation to the pure land. Throughout this book, uh, I have tried to show how women's things created and used by secular women as means to bridge bodily connections with the female deity Guan Yin. Material objects open us to a world of women's experience, usually concealed um, by the textual sources and male discourse. Through these material practices, women gained their own religious authority. Thank you for watching.